what's been happening to me in, in recent months has been a, a firming up of the idea of natural inclusion as a far deeper, uh, more sense-making idea of the notion of, 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 ev of evolutionary process and evolutionary creativity than natural selection. And it seems so obvious to me. I've been using natural inclusion from time to time, you know, for about a year, a couple of years, and yet I hadn't, it, it just really hadn't occurred to me to say, well, actually, let's actually talk about natural, natural inclusion as distinct from natural selection, or, or unnatural selection, as I feel it to be, and say, well, what is, what is the distinction between natural inclusion and natural selection or unnatural selection, the Darwinian idea of selection? And suddenly that has become a very sort of prominent focus in my thinking, is that if we can actually, it's such an easy idea, natural inclusion, it's sort of it's an immediately appealing idea to anyone, much easier than inclusionality, which is a nice idea, but it's, but it's, it's requiring more work for someone to sort of get the, the difference between inclusionality and rationality. But natural inclusion is, almost gives this very different feeling compared with natural selection. And I was trying to think, well, you know, how, what is the difference? And I mean, I came up with a description a little while ago, which is simply to think of natural inclusion as the co-creative fluid dynamic transformation of all, through all, in receptive spatial context. Now that's quite a lot of words, but that's the essence of natural inclusion. Is, is, is it's an all transforms all, or is steered, all is steered through all kind of thinking, which is associated with a fluid dynamic geometry as distinct from a fixed geometry of nature. Then I was reading a book uh, ostensibly about the unconscious mind by Guy Claxton and came across his discussion of creativity uh, in terms of two phases of brain activity, which he called the inspiration phase and the elaboration phase. And the way he described it in the book actually gave the sense that the, the, the inspiration phase was pretty much unconscious and almost random in its, in its method of working, and the exploration phase was kind of selected out uh, from the inspiration phase. And so, in a sense, he was actually giving a, a conventional, in my mind, um, evolutionary psychological explanation of the relationship between these two phases uh, it, going on in the brain, which actually, you know, corresponds. Uh, you know, I, as I read it, I felt here is a sense of betrayal. Here is a sense of, you know, not really showing how these two phases are actually completely interdependent uh, upon one another, and how each, in a sense, energizes the other. Anyway, in his description uh, of, of these two phases, uh, I, I was just reminded very, very strongly of an old piece of work that we did back in the 1980s, or a student, a research student working with me did it back in the 1980s, where he looked at the way a fungus grew out from a, a, a point of inoculation in a tray full of soil uh, in relation to another, uh, to a woodblock, which is essentially food for this fungus, situated somewhere close, but of course the fungus would have no idea that there was this food block out there. And this series of experiments just showed over, or this, this experiment showed over t a time course how the fungus initially grew out in all directions in a radially symmetrical way. Mm. Then it made connection, and once it had made connection, it, it redistributed its energy along a particular direction, along a particular pathway, focused that energy and re-emerged, essentially looking for more, uh, empowered, yeah? B and and with, the original, with the original explorative part of the mycelium actually being reabsorbed back into, yeah? Into that which emerged out, outwardly. And, uh, this actually seemed to be very, very akin to the process that was being described in, in the brain in relation to the relationship between the inspirational and the elaborational phase. But what was clearly different, as far as, and which you can see in this, in, in this set of illustrations here, or in this actual behavior of a fungus, is that to say that somehow the 
elaboration phase is selecting the best out of the in inspiration phase mm. and then essentially in a sense denying that all that inspiration phase was kind of irrelevant apart from the one that happened to be to make the connection is actually a total betrayal uh, of what's really going on and if it really happened like that if it was only selection then you wouldn't have got any enhancement yeah because you'd have you just got you just got the one path selected and all the rest would have faded out but you wouldn't have got that enhancement but what you can clearly see here that is not that these initial explorers are being regarded as failures uh, that are being excluded from the process but actually that their energies are being redistributed yeah uh, listen into the continuing exploration. So what we're looking at here is a process of transformation and not a process of elimination. And we're seeing the process, what we're actually seeing very, very clearly is, is, is that, so it's an, a process of integration and simplification by integration, yeah? As distinct from simplification by extermination. So essentially the Darwinian perspective is everything gets simplified by, by extermination. Whereas the inclusional perspective is that things get simplified by integration. And what's also being shown here is this difference, and it's got just faded out of view, and it comes back magically. <laughs> what, what's also being shown here is that, in essence, it's showing how the initial phase is actually a non-linear phase of opening of the self, in some sense, to all possibilities and it's exploring out in a curved space. The linear phase emerges out of that initial exploration. So here we see clearly illustrated the idea of linearity emerging out of non-linearity. Almost all our thinking, our orthodox traditional thinking, gives linearity precedence. Uh, and this is associated with Euclidean geometry and putting everything into a neat and tidy box with x, y, z, and x, y, and z coordinates. Uh, and then, and then in the traditional way of thinking, you try and get non-linearity out of linearity, but you can't. <laughs> you, you can't do it because the, because it, it's back to front. Okay, and, and calculus is actually about. Newton's attempt to, 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 to essentially what he did was he took a lovely natural curve, cut it up into infinitesimal pieces, rebuilt the curve from the bits, but actually something had gone desperately missing. Yeah? So, so almost all our Western Orthodox thinking tries to bring, build the curve out of little, little linear bits, yes. but in fact you can't. Um, the, linear, the linear actually is emergent from the curved space, not the other way around. The curved space, essentially, the curved space is involving an understanding or an opening of the self to everywhere, so it's an, a non-local aspect, yeah? which is then being channeled somewhere. And this is the impo fantastically important relationship between the non-local and the local, which is at the heart of an inclusional understanding of the self. Our orthodox understanding of the self has the, has, has the self essentially dislocated from everywhere. And it's, only, it's purely somewhere local. And that almost implies that all its actions have to arise by magic. The magic of free agency, the magic of free will. Somehow its, its, its behavior is coming from some internal center, which is yet dislocated from the everywhere that it derives its energy from. Um, whereas the fungus is showing very clearly that the, in, in all real world relationships, uh, we don't have individual form as discrete form with a, with a, with a fixed local center which is governing. We actually have uh, all, all forms of movement and behavior actually involving this dynamic relationship between the everywhere as a source of energy and the somewhere that emerges, yeah? or forms from there. So if you like, there's a real, really key difference here. It's, it's between the notion of our classical way of thinking has been of forms being activated into movement. So discrete form activated into movement by external force. Yeah? And, and the reverse view we're trying, trying to show is that actually we have a continual forming yeah? where the structure emerges yeah, out of the forming is the other way around. So essentially,